Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, he is the face of college hoops for CBS Sports, a senior writer for The Athletic covering college basketball and also the author of Wooden, A Coach's Life. Uh, If you have watched sports over the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years or so, you will know very well Seth Davis. Hello, sir. You're making me feel old, but I am old, so that's okay. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Listen, you, you, for as much traveling around and like, you know, all the stuff you have to do to cover an entire sport full time, I'd say you look pretty good. You're, you're aging well. I haven't worked a day in my life. And believe me, I'm not breaking my streak with this podcast. <laughs> um, well, we appreciate you coming on. Um, I know your time is valuable. So. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, no problem. So I'll get right into it. Um, well, I, I want to. I'm putting up a mock draft because I know you want to talk about the draft and these pop up ads. This is why everybody listening should subscribe to the Athletic because we don't have pop up ads. I uh, Fred Katz, uh, who covers uh, the Knicks now for the Athletic, is a a KFS regular. I always sing the Athletic's praises on here because it's listen, it's the best sports coverage out there. Um, yeah. Uh, so. There's been a lot of talk of late uh, about several teams, including the Knicks, trying to trade up for one Jaden Ivey. Um, you've obviously seen Ivey now, uh, as we all have for a couple of years, really ascended to a more prominent stage this season. Um, with the understanding that, you know, the comparisons to like John ja Morant do him a disservice because it's, you know, not the same player. Um, do you think he has that? kind of certain something special that you can't put words to where if you're a team like the Knicks and you are in need of a star that he's the guy that maybe you should bank on and give up what it would take to go get him? Well, I, I'd say he has that potential. I mean, the, the John Morant comparison, I think is it misses the mark. For, first of all, just from an athletic and uh, agility standpoint, John Morant is is in, truly in a class by himself. If you wanted to talk about physically, athletically, stylistically, body type, I think Russell Westbrook is a better comparison. Either way, you're getting a, a great athlete. But John Morant is a true point guard. Yeah. Uh, Jaden Ivey is not. And so if there's one thing that gives me a little bit of pause – uh, about him as as an NBA player, it's it's that um, that he is a, a combo guard who can create, um, but he's a scorer. Uh, he's uh, more of a scorer than a shooter. Um, his shooting definitely got better from freshman to sophomore year, so that was impressive. You'd like to see guys getting better. Um, you know, they lost twice in the NC tournament earlier than they should have, maybe. So you know, they lost to. Um, uh, St. Peter's. And then uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on who they lost to at, when he was a freshman, they lost in the first round. They got upset. Yeah. Um, but uh, so that gives you a little bit of pause, but he, he, he is, you know, like I, I, I do this column every year that's coming out on Monday where I talk to a bunch of every, a uh, bunch of NBA scouts. I'm excited for that one. I always, yeah, read. <laughs> that's, that's, my Finch column. that's my world popular Finch column comes out on Monday. And, and, and the number one thing that everybody says when I throw out the name, Jaden Ivey, best athlete in the draft. And, you know, when you're talking about uh, the NBA, and especially at the two or the three, that's really what it comes down to. It's not, it's not, look, there are certain guys, you know, a guy like maybe Jalen Brunson comes to mind that aren't, you know, these great vertical athletes, but if you want to be a, a superstar, all-star, a guy who's potentially going, you know, fourth in the draft, third in the draft, um, then athletically you need to be at a certain level at that position. And, and, and he certainly is. So, uh, you know, his, his mom is a women's basketball coach at Notre Dame. He's grown up around the game, a uh, high character kid. And, um, and we'll see, I think he'd play well in New York. I think, I think his style of play, his strength, his athleticism, getting him out in the open court um, will be really exciting for those fans in the garden. So I could definitely see that. I could definitely see that. Yeah, and that, that other team you were searching for, North Texas, uh, definitely there you go. not there a, you go. Not there a team go. they, they it's really should out here. In, it's really out here in L.A. I got my, <laughs> my coffee going, so the, the synapses aren't firing. It's, it, trust me, it's all good. I have my share of blankings. Um, so you mentioned good transition. You mentioned uh, athlete, and you mentioned uh, coaches, coaches' kid. Good transition to A.J. Griffin. Uh, obviously, coaches' kid. Uh, coach that Tom Thibodeau knows pretty well. Um, and then, you know, the concept of athleticism is something that I really struggle with when I watch the tape of AJ Griffin, because just looking at the way he moves and you look at the injury history, if you were, you know, considering him as a, as a pick and he may be there at 11 for the Knicks, you don't have to trade up. 
what do you make of a guy like that who just, you know, he, you look at how teams are moving, like with the finals just ended last night, teams, you know, defenders flying around the floor. I'm really concerned about his ceiling on that end of the court. Um, so what, what would you make of AJ Griffin? Yeah, you, that, that's the word I would think about him is, is his ceiling. I think his ceiling um, is not as high, frankly, as some of these other prospects who could go later uh, in the draft. Um you know, again, you do have to keep in mind that he basically missed his last two years of high school. He played some yep. as, as, as a junior and then he got to Duke and he tweaked his knee again. So he kind of got a little bit of a late start. Now, once he was in the fold and once he was uh, playing well and healthy, he made a huge difference um, for that team. For that team. So, um, you know, you love his size and you love his shooting stroke. I think he shot 45 percent from three. Of course, it's the college line. So he brings some things to the table, but he is not a a high. I mean, we're talking about Jaden Ivey. I mean, no one was really a Jaden Ivey in, in this draft. But, you know, you could look at I'm just looking at one of these mock drafts um, right now at some of these other players kind of in that vein, like a, a guy like Jeremy Sohan, who's yep. climbing up the the, the ranks, Jalen Duran um, from Memphis is kind of a wild child, but a freak uh, size and, and, and a great athlete. Um, AJ's teammate, Mark Williams, um, sure. yeah. doesn't do as many things uh, well as, as Griffin does, but the things that Mark Williams does well, he does exceptionally well. So if AJ Griffin is going to take the next step as a pro, and there's no reason he can't take this step. He's going to need to be able to create off the dribble. Now he's a big kid. Uh, for his position, he's uh, listed as what six six, probably six. Yeah, he's listed yeah six six, two twenty five. I mean, he's yeah, he's solid. So he's probably six five, uh, <laughs> yeah. as, as Clark Kellogg calls it, program height. <laughs> uh, so uh, really good size for his position, and and a really good stroke. And hey, you know there are a lot of really good NBA players who are kind of playing in space and keeping their hands ready and and making a lot of money and and being very effective as a catch and shoot. I don't think AJ will ever be an NBA All Star. Um, but you know, he, he's going to have to develop that part of his game, putting it on the deck, creating scoring in a lot of ways, you know, at college, he was very much a straight line driver and a catch and shoot th- a three point shooter. It's gotten him this far. It's got him, you know, pretty much in, in, in the back of the lottery as a, as a freshman in college, but for him to take that next step, that's what he's going to have to improve on. And, you know, you mentioned the Finch piece, which I'm so excited to read when it posts on Monday, um, you know, talking to all of the, you know, the, the guys who watch these, I, I remember some great lines you've had from pieces in the past. How much do you think when NBA evaluators are trying to figure out what type of work ethic a guy has and will he put in the work to get from whatever they are now to that next level, how much uh, do you think they put into what all of these college, you know, evaluated or people who have watched them, you know, in, in college have to say, they are always digging on that. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, a great question, John, because that, that to me, that's the thing that you can't ever know, you know, like yeah. I looked at a guy like, uh, you know, Donovan Mitchell, you know, he's a great out, example. He came out of Louisville, you know, that he was just an athlete and not much more. So you say, wow, he's got, Potential, but I mean, nobody could have foreseen what he was able to uh, improve upon. To me, the classic case of somebody who exceeded the expectations that I had for him coming out of college is Kawhi Leonard. I bet. How did I know you were going to say Kawhi? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he's at the top of my mind. I watch him. I'm like, I just, I mean, even Steph, you know, they, they won the, the championship obviously last night and um, he a- a- exceeded expectations, but it was kind of within the realm that he would be a great NBA player. Cause he was such a good scorer and such a wizard with the ball. Kawhi didn't have any of that. So that really is the work that goes into the draft, the evaluating the video, all of us can do that. You know, yeah. now maybe they have a, a longer basis of comparison, you know, they're quote unquote experts, but they, you know, they miss out on guys just, just like we would, you know, and, and, and that's the differentiator Who, who's going to improve. Um, it, it, th- that that's the scary thing because you just really, you just really can't tell, you know, there's another guy in, in this draft, Kendall Brown coming out oh, of there. Sure. I, I was quite surprised how down the scouts were on Brown because he's a, he's an elite level NBA athlete, but he's got no ball skills. But to me, that is something that you can learn over time. Uh, what he does athletically, you can't learn, but they were very down on him. They're like, man, he scares me. 
Like he's one of those guys, like you're scared to pick him. You're scared to not pick him. So um, they spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how these, these players, um, you know, their family histories, uh, their psychological makeup, who do they have around them? The interview process is important to them. Uh, the workouts are important to them to see how they respond in, in a lot of different situations. But at the end of the day, it's a big old guessing game. And there's a lot on the line with these guesses. Yeah, millions and millions of dollars in organizational futures. So that's, you know, right. only that. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, what you're talking about now when I was going back and reading your your all glue team from this year. And I think Dalen Terry was the captain yep. this year. Yet another Wildcat to to get that designated. You love those Wildcats on your glue teams. Of course. Uh, uh, is there a guy that you've seen this year where you're like, he's going to out outdo his expectations based on where he's drafted, just based on whether it's work ethic or like behind the scenes stuff that you've seen or heard. Well, it probably doesn't quite fit because I know he's going to be picked real high. And as long as we're talking about the Arizona Wildcats, I'll, I'll stay with it. But, you know, I got, I got laughed off the NBA TV set many years ago. If you ever had my man, Steve Smith on this podcast, <laughs> because I said, is if it, is it possible to be the number one overall pick and still be underrated? And I was talking about Kyrie Irving. And I said, within the next, within the next five years, Kyrie Irving will be one of the top five point guards in the NBA. So I was even underselling what he eventually became. Now his, his character issues. Yeah, I was about to say, we could, that, that's a separate. Not the best example right yeah. now, but in terms of his talent, sure. uh, you know, I, I was spot on. So, you know, to me, Ben Matherin, um, he has a makeup about him that I think is really impressive. And I go back to the game that they played against TCU oh. in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And if, if you want to see one play, it was, it was towards the end of uh, regulation where um, he grabbed an offensive rebound surrounded by, I was, I was just um, writing about it for some of our, we're going to uh, publish some draft profiles on uh, draft night at, at the athletic of these guys. Once oh, they're fantastic. I, I went back and watched, watched the video of this again. Uh, he was literally surrounded by four TCU players and it was the end of the game. And he just ripped that rebound in the middle of, of these guys and put it back in and, and got fouled, missed the free throw. But uh, it, it was that competitive instinct. He actually started off the game two for nine and ended up with 30 points. So to me, high, high level athlete, I think along the lines of a Jaden Ivy, probably a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. um, interesting background. And again, I, I don't know if this is biased, but, you know, I did, I did an in-depth feature on him for the athletic where I really dug into, you know, he grew up in uh, Montreal in a really rough neighborhood. Dad wasn't around. Mom was kind of in and out a little bit, um, had an older brother, older sister played for North Carolina state and then had an older brother who he's very close with was hit by a car and killed when he was, when he was 12, when the brother was 12. So he, he's been through it, man. And then he ended up going to the NBA Academy in Mexico city, which really saved him. So um, he's had to, much come a long way and he's had to show a lot of toughness and resilience. He's got a great stroke. He's got to improve his, his uh, playmaking and creating skills. But again, to your earlier question, John, about work ethic, the ability to improve, like I, I, I think it could end up, I, I think Ben Matherin could be like a Donovan Mitchell. I mean, I think he could be that level of, Oh, wow. Of in the, in the, uh, NBA. Yeah. Another uh, two footed leaper, uh, a reader of mine made that comment that trying to draw that comparison. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. Unfortunately, I think Ben's gonna gonna be gone before the the next pick, but we'll yes. we'll see. Yeah, uh, as as he should. Um, a couple more, and then uh, we'll we'll get you out of here. Uh, another guy I'm just very curious about because of the type of season he had, where he came out of the gate um, just blazing as a sophomore at Wisconsin. Obviously, I'm talking about Johnny Davis, and then the year kind of went a different direction, a little bit maybe because of injuries and stuff. It, when you see a guy who is a shot maker of that caliber at the college level, it, it, what is your process when you, and again, I know this is not your, your job per se, but when, when you try to, you know, visualize what they're going to be when the defensive talent gets that much more difficult and like all of that stuff at the, at the pro level, what do you see in Johnny Davis in terms of his, maybe his ceiling his floor, any, anywhere you want to go on that? Yeah, I, I do see a ceiling. I do see a ceiling. Um, you know, he is one of those guys that you kind of wonder about how is he going to translate to the NBA level? Um, he, he's a good enough athlete. Mm -hmm. But again, we're talking about a, a 
shooting guard slash small forward, probably closer to shooting guard. Um, I mean, those are some of the best athletes in the world, right? Yep. I mean, it's one, two, three position in, in the NBA. And I don't know that he's at that level. You know, this is a question. Can you guard your position? That's going to be a question with him. Uh, his, you know, we know about his scoring going up from freshman to sophomore year, but his three point shooting actually went down. He shot 39% as a freshman and 31% uh, as, as a sophomore. Now, one of the things that I look at because I know, and the scouts look at this is the free throw shooting and he is a 79% free throw shooter. So that tells you that uh, he has the mechanics. He has the strokes. Now he needs to adjust that to the, the NBA line. Uh, and he, again, a very high character kid. Um, so you, you have to assume, I certainly assume um, that, that he'll put in the time. Um, but, you know, I also kind of fall back to this and, and Jalen Brunson is a great example of this guys who are like, player of the year candidates in college, they ended up being pretty good pros. I remember, <laughs> yeah. I remember this probably before you we were born, you know, cause you're young and I don't like you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that young. Trust me. Antoine Jameson. Oh, I listen. I remember okay. Antoine and UNC, North sure. Carolina. I remember people being like that. I don't know. I'm like, he was the best player in college basketball. I think he's going to figure out a way. And he turned out to be a really, really good pro. 20,000 so, points uh, later. Yeah. 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 He's <laughs> Pro. So, you know, these are guys. And, and again, I love guys who got better. I mean, look, people were down in Luca Garza. I think he had a, a solid rookie rookie season, with a lot of promise, adjusted his body accordingly. So I think they make adjustments. Look, if you're at that position, the number one thing is we, we, we saw this with our current NBA champions. You got to shoot that three pointer. You got to make that three pointer consistently against NBA level defense. You got to be able to shoot it deep. Uh, Johnny Davis knows that. I'll bet while you and I are, are pretending like we're, we're busy right now. Uh, he, he's, he's in a gym somewhere getting up shots because uh, he had that improvement. You know, guys, the, the scouts love to see guys who have already improved. And so he made a huge jump from his freshman and sophomore year. And if he adds that NBA three, he does have that create. We're talking about AJ Griffin now. I mean, he does that have creation in between game. He's got a nice big body, a live body. And, yep. you know, in a lot of ways in the NBA, it's, a, it's easier to get your shot off. Uh, than uh, for off. sure. Shorter shot clock and it's a more wide open game. So I think he'll be a successful pro, but he like just about everybody in this draft, he's got steps to take. Uh, last guy, I want, perfect transition. Last guy I want to ask you about is a guy who certainly shot it well, certainly improved over uh, not one, not two, but four years of college. And oh, by the way, he got a nice shiny trophy for his trouble. Um, and that's like Baji out of Kansas. I uh, just came in with the Knicks for a workout uh, the other day. It seems like if the Knicks have a type, uh, at least under Tom Thibodeau, it's, hey, this guy could come in. He could perform on an NBA floor today. Um, maybe there's a limited ceiling, but what, uh, what do you make of him uh, potentially as, as a pro? And what did you like or not like about him in college? Well, again, you know, when you say Kansas and, and this type of player, I was like huge on Ben La Ben McLemore. And that was way um, so keep that keep that in mind. Uh, there's a lot to like about Abaji. It's so funny to me talking about how, how old I am. Uh, um, you know, oh, he's, he's a senior and he's a, he's a, he's a completed I mean, he's 22 or whatever. He's, like, he's a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, how about you, you want to keep him in, in, in the Kansas thing? How, how about our guy, Andrew Wiggins and how he has been, he's 27 and yeah. he's just, he's just figuring out like, Oh, this is, this is how hard I have to play, you know? So uh, to me, Ochai Abaji is still a work in process. He's got a terrific shooting stroke. He's a really good athlete. I mean, he is a high, he may not be Jada Ivy, but I think he's a little bit underrated um, with his athlete. You know, one of my scouts said, I wonder about his, his functional athleticism. I think he'll, he'll develop that. But I mean, you're talking about a guy who goes, what, uh, you know, six, five, 200, 210. Um, he's got all the makings and he's a very, very high character kid, got better four years in college. Again, is he an all-star, you know, maybe not, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't count him out. I wouldn't count him out again. He was an all American in college and those guys usually go on to have long and successful pro careers. Uh, last question before I get you out of here, very quick one. Yeah. You're running an NBA team. Who's your top pick? Interesting because again, for my Finch column, uh, with, with all of the uh, debate, oh, the you know conversation, who's going to be number? There was no debate amongst my guys. All of them were, were like Jabari Smith. Like, don't even hesitate. Yeah. So that sways me. That sways me. But I can make a very strong case for Chet. I actually lean Chet. I actually lean really. 
Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I would have, you know, it's like <laughs> you know, these guys say to me, they say, well, would you bet your, would you bet your job on, on him? And I say, no, but I bet your job on him. <laughs> um, you know, to me, Chet, if John, if you go back and look at Chet's stats for the year, if you go, oh. from, I, I want to say maybe late December ish to like the third week of February, he shot like 50% from three. I mean, he is a ridiculous shooter. Now I think when, when they got to the end of the season, the teams got better, obviously that he was playing against. And frankly, I think he puckered up a little bit uh-huh. um, and, and didn't quite have the confidence in his stroke. But again, for a seven, one guy, when he's going to have wide open three point shots, because you can see he's going to be guarded by fours and fives. You can't, oh, yeah. be, you can't be six ten, six eleven, and close out hard on Chet Holmgren um, from behind the three point line. And so he gives every indication that that he can do that. He can obviously put it on the deck. He can handle and pass in the open floor. And then what he does have, which Jabari doesn't, is the defensive dimension around the rim. And people talk about Chet's body, but you know Jabari Smith ain't no Adonis. You know? <laughs> I mean, he's not a. Big, he's like a KD. I mean, KD's not yeah. a strong kid. And and so in today's NBA, uh, Chet Holmgren really has a chance to be. You know, I mean, you hate to throw like a Luka Doncic at him. Obviously, they're different types of players, different body makeup. But this thing about Chet's body, I don't see him getting physically banged around a lot. It's it's more about his his durability, right? Like that's a question of sure. Zion Williamson. No one's oh. not worried about Zion Williamson being physically overpowered in the NBA, but over an 82 game season, X number of games, NBA. Will he playoff, break down? Yeah. X number of years. How that's the question with Chet, but in terms of his body, his skill set, and the defensive component, I, I, I lean Chet, but I'm glad I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> if I actually had to make that decision, I might, I would probably take Jabari because he's the safer pick. Um, no one's going to rip you for taking Jabari over Chet. You're not losing your job if you take if you no, take Jabari. No, but I I, I kind of lean Chet. I do. Okay. Thank. You. Well, I appreciate your honesty. Uh, yeah. Listen, I usually ask guests where where folks could find them. Everybody knows where to find you. CBS, like you said, Athletic. I cannot wait for the Finch Com. It is. Just, it's like it's a like Christmas morning when that thing comes out because there's always some like. Man, how did you? I know it's anonymous, but like, how did you get people to say some of the stuff that people? Oh, inevitably, inevitably, I'm sure this year is going to be no exception. Uh, can you tell folks where are they going to be able to follow you on draft night? Watch you somewhere? Where, where are you going to be? Well, I am probably going to be uh, in New York City getting ready to take my uh, one of my sons to summer camp, which was oh, our okay. <laughs> shout out to Barry Craver. Um, I'll, I'll be on, I'll be on Twitter. I'll be on. Twitter. Okay. I'm not on TV, but but we're going to be the athletic uh, on draft night. We're going to have all these uh, sort of medium sized profiles of all of the draft prospects. So as soon as the Knicks make their pick. We're going to have 900 words from me or somebody else uh, about who this player is and where he came from and what he brings to that team. So the athletic is a, uh, is, is the place to be on draft night. I, I say it every time I have an athletic writer on, um, they're always running deals. You get it for like a dollar a month. Uh, it, it's crazy. And it's not only local coverage of, of the Knicks, but again, Seth, your piece, uh, the Finch piece, there's all kinds of great scouting stuff going from the last month from like David Aldridge, other guys who are getting behind the scenes things from from pro scouts, college scouts. It's fantastic. Seth Davis, I cannot thank you enough for spending a few appreciate minutes coming you guys. Out. Good luck. Go Knicks. Go New York. Go New York. <laughs> thank, we appreciate it. Thank you. All right, John. Thanks. Be well. Seth, thank you. All right. Thanks, Andrew. You got it, pal. Be well.